Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Is this mic actually? Yes. Okay. This is working. Test, test, test. That's the mic for this thing. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it's not the mic for the. No. So yeah. Yeah, this, this, kind of, this is just all right. Does, does this mic work? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. We're welcome to the uh, Tech Conflicted Age, <laughs> where we have competing technologies. Uh, there's actually two different microphones and a bunch of electric equipment. This is the first time we've actually uh, sort of recorded. Is that right? We were pilot tested last month, so this is beyond the experimental stage. It's in the production mode. Okay, I'll speak more loudly. This one is potentially on, but it's not going to you. It's going to the alternate tech world. <laughs> and this one's supposed to be working, but if it's not loud enough, I'll just yell. So greetings, everyone. Um, your first skill testing question is, what does Bond, have, what Bond University and University of Oxford have in common? And the answer is Paul Glasio, our guest speaker today who is from both worlds, like our tech conflicted world, he's cut the foot in both camps. Paul, I've known for quite a long time, and he's been a friend to and colleague of people in the uh, evidence-based medicine, and even before uh, critical appraisal of the medical literature world, uh, Dave Sackett visited Australia in 1988 and conscripted Paul to the cause, uh, and Paul's been one of the leaders and developers of, of evidence-based medicine. Uh, as a uh, professor of evidence-based medicine in the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford, and now as the director for uh, the Center for Research in Evidence-Based Practice. We were just talking about this, and Paul admits that uh, this potentially could be considered to be a step backward from actually implementing evidence and practice to doing research in it, but then there are lots of issues on the research side that need uh, exploration, and Paul's certainly the person to do it. So I'm not going to give you a longer introduction to that, except to tell you where Bond University, no, anybody want to volunteer where Bond University is? It's very close to the sea, or the ocean. Close enough, is that right? And you're able, when you go to Bond University, to, to um, surf before you go to work, and then go to work. So. Paul's going to tell us how you do that, or something along those lines. And I'll turn things over to Paul now for his presentation. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'll wear this and let me know if I'm not talking loudly enough. Can you hear me okay at the moment? Great. Okay, well it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, a visit here in about 1990, I think it was, was the sort of seminal moment for me realising the importance of evidence-based medicine before Gordon had invented the term. Um, so I came here and, and spent a few days here and Dave Sackett took me on ward rounds and um, I, I remember particularly a ward round with Deborah Cook that I just found fascinating when the students pulled out nomograms and calculated their using the ferritins, what the post-test probabilities were, and I couldn't believe this was actually real. I thought, uh, this has got to happen in the rest of the world, hasn't it? I've got to start doing this in Australia. And so I've been working on trying to do that ever since, but um, the session we were having this morning in Toronto, in Toronto at the Society for Evidence, uh, sorry, the Society for Medical Decision Making, it seems that hasn't spread around the world as rapidly as we might have liked. Anyway, I'm going to talk about something that in some ways is very familiar to all of you, which is about the, the, the deficits in research. And we're used to being aware of these when we critically appraise papers. We see there are problems in the papers. When we do systematic reviews, we're used to the publication bias. And often we think of that as, as problems from the user end. But um, Ian Chalmers and I were, were thinking about the problem of going right from the beginning research question to what actually happens with the patient at the other end. Um, 
and we're tr trying to map out the whole territory between those two points. Um, and this is the first part of that, and it's the sort of research production phase. And we realised it was actually a problem that the funders should be aware of as well, is, is, is what we thought of as the waste that occurs in research. And in a sense, I think most of us, the people in this room, are probably used to seeing that, but not the implications of it to the funders who were rather surprised when we did this calculation. And the sort of off the bottom line of what we came up with was this four-stage model, which was published in The Lancet last year, which is about the formulation of the question using good methods, whether the thing is ever published and whether the publication is actually a usable publication. And when we put it together, we discovered, that we estimated that about 85% of the research that gets funded actually goes to waste. Um, and if you calculate that, it actually turns out to be a rather large amount of money, which I'll come back to in just a moment. That's because the global health budget, this comes from um, a report prepared for WHO, has been, as you might expect, climbing. Um, and the 2005 figure was 160 US billion dollars. Um, the split is pretty equally between um, public uh, funding and private funding, and obviously a huge proportion of that is actually um, US funding. Um, and again, both public and private funding, um, with, the, with Europe probably being the second largest after that. Um, <clears throat> so that's the sort of base of it. And as I said, we broke it up into these four stages of what the question itself, whether that was an appropriate question for research, whether there was a good design, whether there was ever a publication, and whether the report was usable. The first one, I'm going to go through each of the four stages, but with the first one we couldn't really quantify the amount of waste there. Couldn't say how often there was an inappropriate question. But for the other three it's actually um, reasonably quantifiable and we'd reckon at least a 50% loss is a pretty conservative estimate at each of the stages. So if you multiply those out, because you've got to make it through each of the stages, you've got to have a good design, you've got to get it published and the report's got to be usable, but for it to actually be usable at the other end, then you roughly calculate that it's probably of the 85, of the 160 billion, about 85% is wasted. So that's over $100 billion a year that is going to waste. Now, in a sense, that's familiar, but when you put the numbers on it, the amount of waste, and the, uh, the elements of this are familiar to people who've been working in evidence-based medicine, but funders sort of take notice of this and say, well, shouldn't something be done about this? And actually, we're not sure what to do about this. Um, we made a series of suggestions in the paper, but they're fairly um, preliminary ones, and we're actually looking for ideas for each of the stages and what you might want to do about it. So I'd really appreciate, if you have ideas, about what we could do to fix each of the stages as I talk about them. Um, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, but if you write them down so you don't forget them um, during the talk, I'd really appreciate that. If you have a bright idea to solve even part of one of the stages, that would be great. Because I figure making a small difference in this is probably better than me doing any new research would be to make a 1% difference to this wastage process. Okay, when I talk about this, some people get worried that all research, research is a waste um, and, and, they, and what they tend to think about is the sort of negative results, the things that don't work out. So when I talk about this now, I want to introduce the idea of necessary wastage in research. And a good example of this is um, Thomas Edison, when he was trying to invent the light bulb, just tried all sorts of things, basically. He gradually narrowed down on the carbon filament and then tried dozens of different carbon filaments. Um, eventually finding a particular bamboo grove in, I think it was Japan or Taiwan, that gave him the best carbon filaments, which ended up being in the light bulbs. But he was asked by a reporter about this, how his non-success, and he said, young man, why would I feel like a failure? Why would I ever give up? I now know definitively over 2,000 ways an electric light bulb will not work. Success is almost in my grasp. The other example I use of this is WD-40. You know, everyone, is that a familiar product here? Do you know why it's called WD-40? Exactly. <laughs> and that's just typical of research. And that's the necessary wastage in research. You've got to do a lot of things. A lot of them don't work. Um, and and um, you've got to sort out which ones do work and which ones don't. And that's the purpose of research, is that sort of evaluate, development and evaluation. So that's necessary wastage. What I'm, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is the unnecessary research. Um, and this is just a picture of the sort of necessary wastage that occurs. Um, this is Ben Dilbegovich's um, 
take of, he was, trying, he was actually interested in whether we had equipoise when we did trials and he took a cohort of 136 successive no, um, trials in myeloma of um, treatment for it and this was the distribution of results from this is extremely negative to extremely positive and this slightly favours but not significantly new treatment, this slightly favours the old treatment but not significantly and as you can see most of them are actually negative in the sense of not pointing one way or the other um, and there's an almost symmetric distribution. There is a slight gain so you can see there is, it wasn't perfect equipoise. Um, there was some extra here and a, the occasional breakthrough. So maybe one in ten things was actually uh, some improvement and very occasionally you'd get a, a substantial improvement but most things weren't actually a real advance over standard treatment and that's um, how treatments um, generally have worked and it's particularly noticeable in, in childhood um, hematological malignancies how that, that has dramatically changed through this very incremental process of just getting everybody enrolled in trials in the UK at least, and I think there's similar, similar figures in the US, 50% of kids having childhood cancers are enrolled in trials. So the most trial intensive area I know. Um, I could actually skip this one, but let me just give you another example of the sort of um, familiar topics of, of things that don't actually work. Vertebroplasty, does that get used in, in Canada? Okay. So you know this is the this is the rise of vertebroplasty in the in the USA from 2001 to 2005. There was a fairly steady rise in, in the rates of its use. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, the the idea of vertebroplasty is you stick a, a needle into a broken um, vertebra, um, inject it with some cement, which rather than putting a plaster on the outside of the arm, you're putting it inside the bone and fixes it and, and should relieve the pain. Um, trouble is. Um, long after it actually been used for, for many years, um, there were two trials of, of sham versus standard vertebroplasty published in the New England Journal at the same time. Um, one was an NIH funded study and the other one was, sorry, that's the NIH funded one and this was an Australian study led by Rochelle Bookbinder in Melbourne. Um, and both of them found absolutely no effect and they've done They've, they've pooled their results, done various subgroup analyses and not found any group in which it was actually effective. Um, for which the, uh, the vertebroplasty community got very upset about this, um, said that they treated the wrong group and in fact there was another trial published so there is actually some doubt about this um, because they said well you actually, only, it's only worthwhile in the very acute fractures less than six weeks um, that also have, have a, a degree of swelling to them. <coughs> so. They actually did the subgroup analyses in those other trials and it showed that it didn't work in that group but this trial was modestly positive. So this was done in the acute fractures published in the Lancet very recently but it was um, an open label trial. That's the standard treatment group and the red line is the vertebroplasty group. There is a statistically significant difference between the two groups but a lot of it's just the gain from the natural history of the condition. Um, and this is the small gain from vertebroplasty which could be a placebo effect um, or it could be that there is a small difference. If you're interested in this, there's a wonderful um, video on YouTube where they in, uh, it's an interview with the, the chief investigator of the trial talking about his expectations of the trial and what went on and he was a believer before the trial and was very disappointed by the results. But the really interesting thing is interviews with the patients who are subjects in the trial and um, uh, one of them is a woman talking about how, how fantastic the, the therapy was for her and she was quite surprised to learn that it was actually the sham therapy and she'd actually have it again. <coughs> okay, so that's, um, that was necessary waste. We have to do that sort of research, three trials, that was, that was um, probably a, a worthwhile thing to do to know that that didn't work. What I wanted to talk about was this unnecessary waste and as I said broken down into these four stages of are the questions relevant to patients and clinicians, are appropriate designs and methods used for those trials, is there an access to a full publication of the results and is there an unbiased and usable report at the end of it. And we're probably familiar that there are flaws in each of those things and as I said you can quantify at least these last three to say there's a fairly substantial waste in each of these stages. Um, but let me talk about this, the unquantifiable one first, the, the questions. 
Um, a couple of slices of this that I'm going to look at. One is this looks at the amount of funding um, that goes from the NIH to fund various areas versus the disability adjusted life years lost that are attributable, attributable to those. And you can see that there's some correlation between them, which is good to see. Um, but you can also see that there are some substantial differences as well. So if you look at these, as this area here, there's about a 20-fold difference in funding for perinatal conditions versus breast cancer. And cancers in general tend to be um, well, well funded. You can get groups um, to support those. And, and what, there are often areas like um, chronic obstructive airways disease, for example, and I can't actually see it there, but dementia and stroke, oh, there's stroke there, um, tend to be underfunded compared with their um, the amount of burden of illness that they actually cause. And partly, I think, is the lobby groups that get involved in this. Breast cancer has a very strong lobby group, and I'm not resenting its research, but um, areas like stroke, you often, and dementia, it's actually harder to get um, lobby groups involved, and often the people taking care of the patients are so busy that they, the patients themselves don't do anything about it, and the, their carers are too busy as well. So they don't form effective lobby groups. Um, if we look at individual areas, this is osteoarthritis of the knee, you could ask patients um, what their priorities were and researchers what they, um, what they are. You can judge that by their behaviour, by what trials are actually done. So the red bars here are the patient priorities and the blue ones are the, the trials actually done. And you can see basically, as you might expect, that the majority of studies are actually done for drugs. That's about 80% of them. Whereas the patient's priorities were they were interested in the effects and improvements in knee replacement, um, education devices, drugs were there but they weren't the highest, um, and complementary and other physical therapies. So there's a mismatch again between the, the priorities of patients and what actually gets done. And again, that's probably due to commercial interest. People are interested in, in trying out their new drug as the main thing rather than what might be of more interest to patients. Um, and won't spend time on this, but there's also the issue of outcomes as well. And I think OMER Act is a group to be commended because of their, the work that they did to try and um, improve the measurements that are used. So this is again, are we asking the right questions? And that, asking the right questions, if we think of the PICO format, actually includes asking the right outcomes as well. And I, many of you probably know the OMER Act story of the, this group meeting um, to try and standardise the questions for, yeah. Well, there wouldn't be a perfect correlation between those, no, but they were suggesting that there are other priorities. So the clinici clinicians or the, well, what, go, what gets funded, sorry, so that was what trials were done, not what things were put forward for funding. And often what gets put forward for funding is things that would be fundable, but also that's the interest of the funders, like people who have a commercial drug to sell. So it's harder, even, even though you might get um, substantial effects for osteoarthritis by, by exercises of the knee, which are effective, you won't necessarily get funding as easily for that as you would for a new drug treatment. Um, so I wasn't suggesting that the patients would know what the likely most effective interventions were, but that's a larger mismatch than you would expect between what patients think they might be interested in getting um, questions answered to. Okay, then the other a similar issue comes up with the outcomes as well. Again, you want a mixture of clinician relevant outcomes, things that the clinician would want to measure as a process of the disease, but you'd also like to know that people are measuring what the patients are interested in. So an interesting story is the one of OMRAC, and just to repeat it for those who aren't aware of this, um, the OMRAC group was trying to standardise what measures were used for measuring um, trials of, osteo sorry, of um, rheumatoid arthritis and they had a, a standardised checklist and they eventually involved some consumers in these conferences that they held regularly and one of the comments was that they left out a major component of, um, of what was important to patients, one of their important symptoms and that was fatigue which they hadn't been aware of as a major symptom but when you talk to patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, a friend of mine gets rheumatoid arthritis and when they get a flare up of rheumatoid arthritis the thing that really disables her is the, uh, is the fatigue that she gets. It's rather like getting the flu, she says, and she's been carried off a plane, for example, because she can't actually move because of the fatigue that she gets. The pain is disabling as well, but she said if she could get rid of one thing, it would actually be the fatigue. 
And the OMRA group listened to this, they actually did the, both the qualitative research and then they did the surveys to check this and decided yes, fatigue was actually a thing that was important to the patients in it and is now part of the routine measures. And I'm telling this story not because OMRA has done a bad thing, I think that this has been an exemplary job in fact in finding out what's important to patients. But it's something that we might want to emulate if we're going to get the questions right when we do clinical trials and make sure that we're measuring things that are relevant to patients. Okay, flawed study design, I don't need to talk about it all in the master, I think, so I'll just flip through a, a few slides here. Um, but this is a more quantifiable one in terms of the study design. Um, so, for example, this is a BMJ paper in 2005 looking at the adequacy of rep and reporting of the allocation and concealment and their conclusion was that amongst this group of trials, almost a fifth of the trials recently published in major medical journals used inadequate um, concealment and a quarter failed to describe, so you couldn't know whether there was adequate concealment. And it's a pretty simple process. We've known about how to do adequate alloc allocation concealment for decades, so you'd think that when somebody um, devised a trial that they would have adequate allocation concealment. It's not a very difficult process, and yet we, we're somewhere between a fifth and a half of them are not actually being adequately done. Um, this is one of um, Doug Altman's looks at the same thing, um, he looked at a, a, a single uh, month of studies published in PubMed, the, all the journals published in November, I think it was 2003, um, and looked at various features of them, including the epidemiology, what was the type of studies being um, used, but also looked at the, some of the design features like blinding and allocation concealment. And again, if we look at the allocation concealment here, you see under-reporting of them first of all, but also that envelopes, which we know um, is often a, a flawed procedure. They can be um, correctly done if they're properly policed. They're not always if you use opaque envelopes which are independently kept by somebody else and policed properly. Um, but they would have been counted, I think, in the centralised versions or a pharmacy version. Then that was about 51%. Um, so, Base, very basic flaws. It's hard to, hard to devise a perfect trial. In fact, I've never seen a perfect trial. But the flaws I'm talking about here are very basic ones um, that would be easily overcome if uh, people understood how to do these processes correctly. Um, another thing that needs to be done, of course, is that when you do a study, it's worthwhile looking at what has been previously done. And I'm going to use two things to illustrate this. One is the use of existing studies to answer new questions. Um, so. An interesting question was whether self-monitoring for INR is a good thing. The initial studies were done to see whether it was a safe thing to do where the patients could control their own INR. They could measure the thing at, at home, so it's a device a little like a glucometer, um, and then they could adjust their own warfarin. Okay, so you might worry that patients can't do this as well as people in the clinic, so you worry they did trials to see whether this is a safe thing to do. But once they discovered it was safe, you could might ask, well, actually, is it, is it, does it result in better or worse overall outcomes? It's safe, it doesn't cause a lot of bleeding, but is it actually a better thing? Um, and that can be answered from existing trials. So this is a systematic review uh, of all the trials done up to 2006. Um, and when we put those studies together, we discovered that there was a statistically significant reduction in all-cause mortality here, the uh, confidence that goes up to 0.98. There's been a subsequent update of this that just confirms that it's, it's about the same effect size that the confidence interval has shrunk further again. So you could answer that particular question by the use of old studies. Do people actually do that very often? Well, surprisingly not. This was an interesting study of the non-use of systematic reviews when designing studies. Um, Cooper and his colleagues wrote to um, 24 authors, or those who responded, they wrote to more of them, to ask whether they'd been aware of existing systematic reviews that they knew were available at the time the trial was being designed. Um, and 11 of them said that they actually knew about it. That is, that they had looked at the systematic review that was relevant to their particular question. So about half of them were not using systematic reviews that they should have been able to easily get access to um, by a fairly simple PubMed search. So they were a little bit shocked by that. Give you another example of this. This is um, a study by Ferguson looking at the question of using a protonin for cardiac surgery, looking at the randomised trials. Um, and this is this line here shows the, the growth in the number of randomised trials that have been done. 
And the little black bars here show the number of references in each of those trials to previous trials. And that seems to steady out at about 10. Nobody ever refers to more than, more than 10 of the previous studies. That is, that they're just not looking, no one's doing the systematic reviews, they're also not looking at all of the previous studies when they actually do this. And if you do the cumulative meta-analysis, it looks rather like this. Um, in fact, this is it. Um, so there's a curve here initially of, it's with some instability and wide confidence intervals, but once we get around here, it starts to be a pretty steady result. But trials continue to be done. We probably don't need many more trials after 1992 though. These seem to be sort of surplus to our needs. So why are, we, why are ethics committees approving these further studies? Um, why are they being done if it's all it's doing is just narrowing the confidence interval on this particular question slightly? You might also ask, well, is, was that the important question to be asked? And in fact, a, a subsequent trial looking at a much cheaper drug, which was tranexamic acid, actually turned out to be better than the aprofen anyway. So we're doing years of trials on something where actually there was a better drug, a better but ch cheaper drug that we could have used. But eventually that trial got done. But it seems to me there was a lot of wastage in that process in not looking at doing the systematic reviews, which are usually much cheaper to do than the trials themselves, and not accumulating the evidence and, and repeating things that didn't need to be done. Okay, those two things are probably familiar and you're probably familiar with the idea of publication bias. We often think about publication bias as just being the problem of bias. But there's also a problem in the usability of the research that there's a lot of it um, not being published that that's actually a waste as well. So it's not that just that you get a bias, it's also that you don't get to use that information. Um, so that's the, the third stage of our problem. <coughs> Um, just to give you a, a particular example of this, this is Alex, Alessandro Liberati. Um, you've got a hematological, um, you know, sorry, myeloma. Um, and he was, he was upset by this and actually wrote an article where he said research results should be easily accessible to people who need to make the decisions about their own health. Why was I forced to make my decision not knowing information was, avail was available somewhere but not available? Was the delay because the results were less exciting than expected or because in the evolving field of myeloma research there are now new exciting hypotheses or drugs to look at? How far can we tolerate the butterfly behaviour of researchers moving on to the next flower well before the previous one has been fully exploited? And he's obviously a bit upset here because this is his condition and he wanted to be able to have access um, to all of the trials about how best to treat his condition but he knew these trials are available, he could see them in the registries for example but he couldn't actually get access to the data for these and he wanted to make a personal decision about this and so was uh, noticeably upset about it. Okay, so we know about the idea of publication bias. This comes from Sally Hopewell's Cochrane Review on the subject in 2009, um, looking at the odds ratio for um, comparing published and unpublished studies for the odds of being significant. Um, showing a bias, but what I, was, what I was interested in here was not just the, the fact that there's a bias, but the rates of non-publication. So these are all of the cohorts, so what she's done here is taken all of the studies where they looked at, for example, the studies that had gone through an ethics committee, and then done a follow-up several years later to see how many of those studies that should have been um, completed and published had actually been published. Um, and the answer to that was amongst these cohorts was about 66%. Um, and the first of these, actually two published almost simultaneously, but one of the early two was um, Kay Dickerson's study. Um, and she looked there at the predictors of non-publication. And the main one wasn't rejection by the journals, it was um, that the authors failed to submit the studies, and particularly their negative studies. So they got a negative study and they were disappointed by it and then they fail to ever submit it to a journal rather than them submitting it repeatedly to journals and the journals rejecting it because it was negative. Um, and that was, uh, this, she, she did this just for trials in this one here, but actually in Kay Dickerson's study she had, it was all studies that had gone through the John Hopkins um, ethics committees and it was equally prevalent amongst clinical trials and non-trials. There wasn't much of a difference in the publication rates. So, so this isn't just a problem for trials and I'll show you a little bit of other data on that shortly. Um, the other relevant review, but done in a slightly different way, is the one by Shearer where they looked at abstracts instead. And here they concluded less than half of all the studies, about 60% of randomised trials or controlled clinical trials, 
initially presented as summaries or abstracts at professional meetings and subsequently published as, as um, peer-reviewed journal articles. That's a huge waste. One example of this was that she, um, one of the studies within this took all of the studies published, uh, sorry, presented at one particular ASCO meeting here, American Society for Clinical Oncology, and then looked, I think it was seven or eight years later, to see how many of those trials were actually published and it was of this order of 50 or 60 percent of them actually being published within six or seven years of their initial presentation. So why does this occur? Why don't people publish their studies? Well, one particular example that I'm aware of because we did the review of um, trials for screening for colorectal cancer is this um, study from Sweden. So it was eventually published um, this is a 68,000 person randomised trial in Göteborg um, and they finalised this in, on the 31st of December 2001 was, was the study closed point and it gets published seven years later in 2008. Now, why the, why the seven year delay? This is a large scale trial and we know with a large scale trial you could probably get this fast tracked by the Lancet and you should be able to write it up and, and get it published within the year. So it should have actually appeared in 2002 with a trial like this, but there's actually a missing author here, and that's Coenta, who died fairly shortly after um, the publication of the trial. And then there was a problem, of course, well, who's now responsible for taking on this trial? And I'd be interested in other people who've experienced unpublished trials, but I've been talking to people who do lots of clinical trials and asking them if they haven't published their trials. Um, and Almost everyone I've spoken to actually has the experience, who have done a number of trials, has the experience of an unpublished trial. And it's often due to some change in circumstances, not usually as dramatic as, as dying. I haven't spoken to any of those. Um, but it's often things like a change in position. So they've moved from one research position to another, they've switched universities, or there was a reorganisation. Or they got promoted, which really stops your productivity as well in publications. Um, or a retirement, and a very interesting retirement case was um, that illustrates the problem of the waste is that I was sitting on a committee that was about to commission a study of adenoidectomy for, um, for glue ear. Um, this is in the UK, the HTA program, um, because there wasn't an adequate study that had been done. And it's an important question. Grommets work but they fall out, so could you use an adenoidectomy instead? Um, and someone on the committee said, well, actually, that trial's been done. There was a very large-scale trial funded by the Medical Research Council in the UK. It finished in 2000, 10 years ago, and it has never been published. And it was basically exactly the same design as we were about to commission that would have cost um, probably in the order of about one or two million pounds to do this study. And it was sitting there. It had been done. What had happened? Well, the chief investigator had retired fairly soon after the finishing of the trial. And he's still working part time, he's doing some things and the rest of the committee continually harasses him and he says, well there's just another analysis that I want to do on this. And he's basically never got it out. It's an interesting question of understanding what the processes are of non-publication and how you would deal with something like this. So one of our proposals is that there should always, always be in any reasonably sized trial, there should be someone who's a designated second in charge, a deputy, rather than having a lot of other co-investigators. You actually need somebody who's the designated um, deputy who would take over if somebody dies, as in this case. Um, so there's a clear line of succession of somebody else that's responsible um, for the data. And there's a few other things you might do as well. Um, does this really make any difference to outcomes? Well, you probably all have heard of the CAST study and the disaster with flecainide and some of the other um, class two antiarrhythmics. You know, the CAST study showed this increase in mortality, the sort of doubling of mortality with echinide or flecainide versus placebo for patients who post MI who had um, um, uh, high degrees of um, potential for, for ventricular um, arrhythmias. This is well documented in Deadly Medicine where um, more suggested that probably something of the order of 50 to 100,000 people may have died. It's been disputed, but certainly there must have been some deaths because this drug was widely used. Could this have been prevented? Well, that was published in 1991 
and interestingly in 1993 someone else who had been investigating the area wrote and said, gee, that's, that may have been preventable through a non-publication. So Cowley said, when we carried out our study in 1980, we thought that the increased death rate that occurred in the drug group was an effective chance. The development of the drug was abandoned for commercial reasons and this study was therefore never published. It's now a good example of publication bias and the results described here might have provided an early warning of trouble ahead. I may have at least got the CAST trial done a bit earlier because there was a lot of controversy about even being able to do the study. Okay, does this only occur with clinical trials? No, it's actually hard to get information in other areas. Kay Dickerson's study suggested that it's anything that's going through ethics committees um, seems to have about the same rate of publication bias and this was one study that compared um, phase one studies with other phases of studies and you can see the other phases here after eight years are getting up to the 50% mark that I mentioned earlier but actually phase one studies are worse. After eight years you've got about a 20% publication rate for phase one studies. Um, we don't know anything about these results for anything that hasn't up passed through an ethics committee because it's hard to set up the cohort to, to work out the numbers. Okay, so that's stage um, three where again we could qualify that there's probably at least a 50% waste in the whole process. Um, the, the, th the fourth stage that is the one that I'm, I've been concerned about most recently and that's the, the one of the usable report um, and just for your amusement, can anyone translate this sign? Right. This is don't park your bike here. <laughs> but it says it in Latin and Greek. This is in Cambridge. I was just amused by the sign. But it <laughs> I was using it to illustrate the point, uh, the, the point that you actually need to have a sign that most people can, or a publication that most people can actually understand before anyone's actually going to do anything about it. Um, so there are actually some bikes. I, didn't, I should have captured them, but there were bikes parked very nearby this sign. People ignoring it. Okay, um, I'm going to give you one, a couple of examples of the problem, one from trials and one from systematic reviews and then just show you some data that we've got on um, how often it's a problem. Um, there was an interesting study published a little while ago in the BMJ about the long-term benefits of salt intake. Um, we've known for quite a long time that if you can get people to reduce their salt, you can get them to reduce their blood pressure. The question was, does that actually lead, do people sustain it for long enough, the salt reduction, um, that it can actually lead to um, improvements in cardiac outcomes, cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and that was eventually proven by the long-term follow-up of the TOHP study. Um, this one here, which is why it made the cover of the BMJ, because for the first time it was shown in a randomised trial that if you reduced salt intake, you could actually improve clinical outcomes. So here's the description in the BMJ paper of what the sodium reduction was. Individual and weekly group counselling sessions were offered initially with less intensive counselling and support thereafter specific to sodium reduction. So I want you to imagine what you're going to tell you, the patient on Monday morning when you see somebody with hypertension about what they should do about salt reduction. What does that actually entail? Try to imagine what it would actually entail. Okay, well it's not in the paper, you won't find it anywhere in the paper but if you, if you go through the references you'll discover um, about 10 years previously when they were designing the study there is a, um, a report that does have some more of the details. Okay, not many people, I, I doubt whether many readers of the BMJ actually went back and did this though but if you bother to do it, here's the full description in the previous reference. An individual session followed by 10, that's now specified, um, weekly group sessions of 90 minutes, which they didn't tell you before, with a nutritionist, followed by a transitional stage of some additional sessions. The topics in the weekly sessions included getting started, sodium basics, the morning meal, midday sources of sodium, the main meal, planning ahead, creative cooking, eating out, food cues and social support. The sessions included sampling of food, discussion of articles on sodium reduction and problem solving. Patients kept diaries at least six days a week and urine sodiums were measured. Did anyone imagine all of those things? <laughs> no. And you couldn't glean that for any, anything from the paper. And even this um, is not replicable because you'd actually need to have all of the booklets, etc., the, the full materials to know what it was that they actually did. 
because there are other trials showing that actually getting sodium reduction to a sufficient degree to lower blood pressure is actually a very hard thing to do. It's got to be pretty intensive and this is one example of a very intensive um, process. For me as a general practitioner, a family doc, I think this is probably infeasible. I'm not going to get my patients to do this or I'm not going to get somebody to fund um, having this sort of thing done, um, but it would be nice um, if that was possible because it would actually um, lower outcomes. But that's not sufficient to describe it. So we got interested in this question and asked, well, how often does that happen with, with studies? How often do you get descriptions like the first one I showed that are actually not replicable in, in any way? So we took 80 consecutive treatment trials from the EBM journal, um, so the sister of the ACP Journal Club, and we had a look. We just asked ourselves the simple question is, could you replicate this next week if you saw a patient with this particular condition? At the time, we didn't have a checklist because we didn't know what the problems were. We subsequently used the problems that we identified to create a checklist that you could go through to say, are there all the elements present? Um, and I think it, when we've used the checklist, I think it's actually worse than this because you miss things without the checklist. Um, so overall, we found about 50% of all the studies we selected for EBM were replicable. So that's the blue bars here. That was initially. Once we did a whole series of things, but the most useful one was actually writing to the author, but sometimes we could track back through other publications. Sometimes we found things on the internet, etc. Um, you could find further descriptions and we could improve that by about 25%. I figured this is the most cost effective thing we could actually do in medicine in terms of the publication process because this took us probably about a day on average of back and forth with the authors and searching and stuff to fix this to get about a 25% improvement, absolute improvement, um, in the replicability of a study. So it's four extra days, if you like, four person days to create a usable study. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that it's different for trials. More, it's better with trials than it is for meta-analyses and it's better for drug therapies than non-drug therapies. Obviously the best thing is probably a meta-analysis of drugs. Um, so there's a particular problem and, and there's a methodological problem with meta-analyses. Um, though it's partly overcome, you can see that there was quite a gain in fact with the meta-analyses that people could actually specify it when, in particular when we wrote to the authors that often write back and tell us um, what was in it. Um, to give you one of the examples that we couldn't replicate and in fact we never got a decent answer to, um, this is something that I'd like to be able to do as a GP and that's to give non-drug therapies for, for adults with insomnia. Um, and the conclusion of the particular systematic review said this confirms the efficacy of behavioural interventions for persons with chronic insomnia. Um, so what I'd like to do is be able to write my prescription for the, um, the behavioural intervention but I have no idea what that means. So we wrote to the author and said, would, what specific treatment regime or regimes would you recommend based on your review? The author's response was, it was found that cognitive, behavioural and relaxation therapies all in general led to similar improvements in sleep outcomes, although cognitive approaches might have been a bit better. The references for these studies are found in the article. So it still then wasn't, we wrote to this author several times by the way to try and get an exact description of something that I could do in practice and never got a, a satisfactory answer. So that was one that was never complete. Because even this, so I, I'm not sure which of the references I should go to. I'd have to go through and find all the references, check each one and find out which of those have a sufficient description of something that I could actually replicate. That's the, not work that any sensible clinician is going to do and clearly the reviewers aren't doing it, but they've actually got the stack sitting there of the papers. They're the one person that has actually managed to find all of these papers. So it just seems like a little more work that they could do that would actually change things. I know that I'm guilty of the same thing now. So. Um, just to give you one other example of this that details it for guidelines as well. A patient once came to me and said they wanted to have some breathing exercises for their chronic obstructive airways disease and didn't like taking medications. Um, and he'd recently quit smoking. I said, can you recommend any breathing exercises? And I'm like, well, I wonder what that means. So I thought, well, I've seen this trial of didgeridoos. So he immediately asked me, well, do you, can you write a didgeridoo prescription on the NHS? Because <laughs> he was fairly poor and wanted to own didgeridoos. In, in the, I was living in the UK at the time. They're actually pretty expensive to buy a didgeridoo in Oxford. <clears throat> So I thought, well, maybe I should check into this. And so I, I, so I looked some things up. 
I, of course, came across pulmonary rehabilitation, which I was aware of, but I hadn't really thought of it. I don't think it's really a breathing exercise, but he was clearly more interested in non-drug therapies. So this is the NICE guideline on pulmonary rehabilitation, this top part here, this is, actually comes from the systematic review. Um, and they say pulmonary rehabilitation is defined as a multidisciplinary program of care for patients with chronic respiratory impairment that is individually tailored and designed to optimise the individual's physical and social performance and autonomy. So what's that? Anyone got a picture of, of what that actually means? So there's a high recommendation that you should actually do this and this, it's, it, it's actually very worthwhile. This is the, um, the systematic review that this recommendation was based on. This is the outcome of hospital admission to the end of follow-up. Um, the forest plot here shows two trials significant, one not quite significant, but all of them having this fairly substantial effect, which when you pool it is a, is a relative risk of point, oh sorry, an odds ratio of 0.1, which is about a 90% reduction in hospitalisation. This is more effective in terms of rehospitalisation than any drug that we know about, than any other treatment that we know for chronic obstructive airways disease. But you've got to know what it is. Okay. The systematic review is not actually too bad on this. It actually gives a table which describes the study. So I've outlined here some of the elements of it. But itself it doesn't actually recommend any particular regime. So you'd ha you can go through the table and pick up from that what pulmonary rehabilitation might be. But it's actually a bit different in each of the studies. What's pretty apparent though from each of these is that basically it's, um, it's exercise is the central component of every one of them. But there's all sorts of other support things around it. There's bits of counselling because patients become anxious when they get breathless when they exercise. Um, physiotherapists do some supervision of them in order to get them to do the right amount of exercise, etc. Um, there's patient education and bits to it. And actually the thing I found most helpful was this thing on, um, from, it was actually one of the trials groups from King's in London who put up a couple of YouTube videos where they actually showed the intervention, some of the details of the intervention and what they were doing with patients and also interviewing the patients as well. Um, and if you're interested in pulmonary rehabilitation, I, I highly recommend um, going to do them. Um, this is just a nice quote from one of the, the patients that they interviewed. He said, pulmonary rehabilitation, like me, I didn't know what that was. So I asked and he said, well, it's an exercise program. And she said, I thought the man was mad because I couldn't get out of a chair. The pulmonary um, chronic obstructive airways disease is so bad. And actually, um, when she's re-interviewed, which is several months later, she's actually walking around the house, going out shopping, etc. She's dramatically trained. And the basis of this is that people can, it, um, just like athletes get fitter, people with chronic obstructive airways disease can get fitter as well. And the hard part is overcoming the fear barriers and getting the right amount of exercise and getting them to persist for long enough because it takes months to get fit or years to get fit. They've got to do this for long enough as well. So there's lots of psychological barriers, but the psychological barriers about exercising enough. Okay, so if we go to um, Brian Haynes' famous 5S, seem to have a problem as we go up the levels of the system. If you go to the single studies is the least problem, you get more of a problem with systematic reviews and summaries. And I suspect we haven't actually done the work on this, but I was trying to illustrate it with a nice guideline as you go up to the, the, um, the synopses and probably the systems. Um, there seems to be a loss of information. I don't think that's a necessary loss. There are some, some methodological problems, but I think you could actually, particularly at the systems level, you could actually have electronic systems that actually tracks back to all of the details that you needed further down. I actually put in here ongoing trials as, or trials because the protocols are the place where you actually have probably the most information, the most description of those interventions. Once they get published, the authors for some reason but also the journals ask for truncated descriptions of that which, we, which are usually inadequate. So this, this progressive loss apparently. Um, the final bit of it which sort of relates back to what I was talking about earlier about the systematic reviews is in the publication itself um, you'd also like to know how this compares with other things. So when you see a trial published ideally you'd like to have it set in the context ideally a systematic review, but they should at least address the other trials. Um, so Ian Chalmers gets very upset about this and has been monitoring this for some time. So they've done three successive studies in 1997, 2001 and 2005 looking at the big five general medical journals, 
um, and categorising them into those trials that this was the first one that ever addressed that question, that occasionally occurs, trials that contained an updated systematic review in, um, in integrating the new results, two actually did that, discussed a previous review but did not attempt to integrate the new results, that's the most co um, that's common, but the most common is no apparent systematic attempt to set the new results in the context of the other trials. So that would be ideal from the reader's perspective and again this is a waste in the research process if you can't actually see um, that you need to have another systematic review in order to be able to interpret this particular trial. Okay, I just wanted to point out that this isn't a new problem. Um, Doug Altman who, who um, has also been feeling just as bad about this for a long time and wrote an editorial in 1994 called The Scandal of Poor Medical Research. He was particularly concerned with that phase two of these simple design features that people make um, mistakes in when they design their trials but he's also concerned with the, the reporting problems as, uh, um, as well. Okay, so what can we do about all of this? I'd be interested in things that you should, you should have been writing down in terms of solutions um, but some of the ones that we had written down in the end here and these are just preliminary suggestions are um, one is that I would like to see an electronic repository that contained the descriptions. Um, pr the protocols is one potential way to do that but another would be to have an entirely separate repository that once your trial particularly for non-drug treatment you could actually get the full description of that and materials could be posted. Um, the second is to change the consort standard and the consort group is very interested in doing this. There's, only, there's one question about what, what was the treatment adequately described at the moment within the consort statement and it doesn't give you any ideas really. I've changed the wording of that now so it now asks instead about the replicability of it. Is this described well enough that somebody could replicate it which I think is a better wording. It focuses your mind on what's really important but it still doesn't have the full checklist about things about um, necessary materials, the timing, how often did you have to do it, how long did patients do it for, what was the exact dose of things etc. Uh, an interesting other suggestion is to use 5 to 10 percent of the funding as a final payment on submission of the paper, not of the report. So a lot of funding bodies ask for a final report but they don't necessarily ask that that be publicly available. One exception to that is the HTA, the Health Technology Assessment Program in the UK won't give you the final payment until you've submitted the final publication and they have got close to a 100 percent publication rate. So that may be enough of a solution to actually solve that problem. Um, I can imagine that the people who are in the position of trying to do their final publication and usually you know, in the department there's all sorts of other things going on, you've got other new projects starting and so you put it on the back burner until you go on sabbatical. But if in fact there was money there that you could get that really you could convince your head of department or whoever else you needed to that actually you needed this time and money to write this up because then you get the final $50,000 or whatever it was, it might be easier to do. Um, another is that we suggested is that people need to be trained in at least the elements of research methods and we think that should be basically critical appraisal and I don't know whether McMaster students for example who've been learning critical appraisal for a long time when they publish, I, I would assume that they publish better studies than most of people coming out of other universities but other universities who get interested in their students publishing stuff often get them to do a research project rather than teaching them critical appraisal skills and I think that actually leads to part of the problem is that they become researchers who don't have the skills in being able to design decent, decent studies. Um, and the, one of our final suggestions was that we need more research to understand the problem. And part of that further research for example is what I was talking about earlier about understanding why people don't publish. Um, an assumption that a lot of people that I've spoken to this about, they assume it's just um, people wanting to, like drug companies, wanting to suppress data for example. That's actually part of the problem but it's certainly not the whole problem. There's all sorts of reasons why people don't actually um, uh, publish their, their studies. Okay, and we're planning a meeting for this um, next year. They're, this has actually gotten a reasonable amount of attention in the UK. Um, they're quite interested, particularly within the, the National Institutes of Health Research, to try and do something about this problem to improve the, the efficiency of research by trying to um, apply some of the principles that we've talked about. Okay, so summary, four stages of research, 
question design publication report and about a 50% loss at each of the last three stages. We couldn't quantify the first stage and that's if you um, can, if you believe that that could be applied across all the different types of research and as we've seen the data suggests that's probably true, then that's about 85% of the 160 billion dollars um, spent per year and some of this at least is readily fixable. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul. If there's anybody who would like to ask questions, I've got to get the official technical answer to this, but that can stand somewhere near this blue lit obelisk. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So please come up so that other people who are on the electronic version of this can uh, hear you. Are there questions or comments, please? Yes, you do. <laughs> no exceptions, even for closing countries. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, the rising part of the center of the year, you got that by somehow multiplying the loss rates of each of the four states. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, that was an assumption. Yeah, yeah. 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 just an assumption that the loss rates. And I put it to you that maybe there's a correlation of dependence, for example, mm. could be the slides with four questions, methodological issues in the execution uh, are more likely to be uh, not submitted to the publication and so on. So the, the net effect of all that would be perhaps considerably less than a five percent loss. Okay, so conservatives I might say between fifty percent because any single save is fifty percent. So if it was a perfect correlation it could be fifty percent. Right? And eighty five percent which is the other extreme. And where it is between those depends on that degree of correlation. But if you look at Kay Dickerson's study, which is um, where she collected a lot of information on things like quality, size of study, etc., they were mildly predictive but not very strongly predictive. The strongest um, um, predictor was whether the study was um, negative or positive, the directionality, or it's actually the significance of the study was the strongest predictor, and it was with the author. Um, there was, a, as I say, a small um, um, effect of things like quality or the size of the study. But I was giving you some examples where, in fact, very large studies have not published as well. So this does occur with high quality, um, large trials as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could be a hundred percent. Some things, some usable things do get published, <laughs> but it could be very close to a hundred percent. The question is: uh, with the we have a clinical trial analysis that occurred in the last decade. Does that actually have any impact on the virtually stimulus of publication, or are we just getting actually better denominator of what's not? My understanding is that we're just getting a better denominator of, of, of what's not published, that it hasn't changed the rates of publication, um, so at least so far. Maybe it's too early to tell, but that seems to be the current um, trend from what I understand from people involved in the registries. Um, the other possible use of the registries, by the way, is to solve the last problem that I talked about, which is the, 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 um, the details that you might like. I didn't actually mention the outcome problem as well that Anne Chen has been working on of, of um, people saying that they, their primary outcome was this but then actually reporting something else as their primary outcome and sometimes not even reporting their primary outcome. That's another waste in the sort of usable publication. Protocols um, being available on those registries would actually help that but at the moment there actually is, is a fairly minimal level of detail being recorded on the registries and not the full protocols. Actually, I am very interested in your paper in 2009, and I also write a paper to the manager. So, yeah, I think there's another way with the research is. Uh, you know, we are uh, very developing countries, very artificial content, but in the context of the paper. So, uh, and the general client uh, has increased part of the organization. 
And uh, so we also uh, conduct a uh, uh, investigation uh, in this data that uh, in China one is the outside of the other and the researchers trying to keep up with by looking at one thing immediately back or access uh, to the You know, I agree. I think it would be great if the full text article of everything was available, but it would be particularly nice for those things that were going to potentially influence clinical practice if the full text was made available, um, which a few journals do, but a lot of journals don't. Um, so, in fact, with my SALT thing, that was a, an example where the BMJ's publication was available, but the earlier publication, you would have had to have paid for the full text to discover there was that unusable, un unrepro unreproducible um, salt reduction regime, but it would be nice if that had been made for free. Um, and even more, it would be nice to have a repository where the materials were available as well. Um, so, one of, an interesting example of this was um, uh, a study of using a video disc, a DVD, to show to patients with uh, whiplash, which they showed in the emergency room. We ended up rejecting it for quality reasons from the, the um, EBM, I think, eventually. But we wrote to the authors anyway, and they said, um, yeah, no, they were willing to make the DVD available for free, and they'd put it up on a website, but nobody had ever asked them. So the journal wasn't interested in it. They didn't have a URL pointing to it. But here was a, here was a potentially usable intervention. Even if you didn't believe it, if you wanted to repeat the research, actually this guy was willing to make it available for free, but no one, no one was interested. In ha there seems to be someone, there's no middle broker um, to, to take those um, things from the researchers and try and put them somewhere because there is no repository where you could just easily put them up where people would be able to find them that would link to the research. Yep, yep. We said it was a of modest translation and also documentation online where researchers, decision makers, and other stakeholders are collaborating with this knowledge. Uh, there might be not necessarily the publication of the findings, but there could be implementation in decision making. Would that change the space to get more of your model? I'm, not, I'm, I'm confused between two possible interpretations of your question. One is that, that those working on implementation research, there's a similar problem of having a full description of what their implementation um, was. The other is that beyond the, the, the four elements of the pipeline here, once you've got the unbiased and usable report, you've still got to, it's got to be published in the ACB Journal Club or something. People have got to become aware of it and they've actually got to start using it. That's the implementation phase. Is, it, is, is that second thing you're talking about? You're suggesting that there are some things where there would be a diffusion process, but of an unpublished piece of research rather than a published piece of research. Okay, can you, if you know, do you know any examples where that's happened, where there's been a, a other than the people who did the research, where there's been a widespread dissemination of something that was never, where there's never been an accessible publication? That, uh, uh, 
I can understand the feasibility of this, but if you, if, if you actually get some specific examples, I'd be very interested in that because I, I suspect that if that happens, it would probably be confined to the country where it was developed. So you still have all the other potential countries which can't learn from that experience. So it's still, even though it's not a complete waste that somebody is using it, there are lots of other places that can't learn from that experience because it has never become pu um, public. It relates to this problem of um, the fully accessible publication. Actually, I can give you an example of that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so in both of the master uh, small group learning programs for family physicians in remote locations that include small practice groups, uh, the person who would be the opinion leader or the expert uh, for that group to liaise with a central location that would disseminate uh, and actually collect questions that the practitioner groups wanted to answer, prepare educational materials, pass them back. Uh, I could never get them to publish the article on that, but they actually had a network of a few hundred practices for mm -hmm. the America. So, mm -hmm. uh, there have been other studies that have shown that that is a more effective model than the didactic lecture group, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could never get them to publish the data, but they had mm -hmm. actually done the dissemination job as part of the, the right. their uh, right. uh, activity. So I have at least one other question. Uh, for the <laughs> <Sorry>? <laughs> okay, so I can like ask a question, right? Uh, one of the goals, well, actually, there's a couple of things which are done in Canada which you can help with. And you mentioned from my video that I know from my video to tell the proposal had been published in other ways to do the fact that the for so mm -hmm. you have to submit a plan for it and so on, but there's actually provided some money to do for health research. Uh, it does that. But the question has to do with the potential harmful effect of increasing the success of dissemination for studies which are of lower quality. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is a gradient here, I presume that the ones that are of high quality, sound done, and so on, are more likely to make a true step. And it's actually weeding out studies which would be biased and were uh, miscarriages of uh, research uh, that should have died in natural death and should not be disseminated. Mm. Uh, I know you're going to say that the researchers might learn from this, but a lot of people who are not researchers might learn the wrong thing from it. So, is there some not only unnecessary, unnecessary reduction, the necessary community that goes along this process is actually beneficial rather than harmful? Mm. Mm. Um. There were two parts to that, Brian. I like the idea of having the dissemination funding at the end, but that's actually a stage past here. I'm just talking about getting to the unbiased, um, usable report, which in your terminology may just be researcher to researcher communication. You may not want this disseminated yet, but you say this is a promising hypothesis which somebody else might pick up on. And unless there's a sufficient description of the results of that research, including a description of the intervention, nobody can pick up on that. Um, so I, I, I like the idea of very selectively, I agree, you know, it's a, I think your number needed to read from the ACP Journal Club is about um, 200, 1 in 200, isn't it, of something that's highly relevant and actually valid, that you want to have the extra funding for the dissemination process, but I think it's still useful to have all of this. I agree that there is some weeding out but there isn't as, as high a correlation as we might have thought if we look at the things like Kay Dickerson's study, looking at the quality and size, etc. And there are certainly examples like the, the huge colorectal trial. It, wasn't, it was as good as any of the trials that had been done, the, the Gothenburg screening study. The adenoidectomy trial was also large and well done, but was never published. And I'm trying to think of the other examples, but my jet lag is slightly kicking in. So we found quite a number of, of, of large, high-quality studies 
that have just never been published. Any other I'm told that, um, that some parts of the NIH you can't get a new funding unless you publish in your, um, your previous studies. I'm not sure whether that includes the main results because that's the part that I'm talking about. So people often publish other things. They might publish you know, an observational study from it or the baseline results or something. Um, but what it would need to be is, is that there's a restriction that unless your main findings have actually been published. Um, if, 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 if people know of other examples of, of ways of doing this, I'd be really keen to hear because we'd be interested in comparing different models from around the world of ways that funders um, can actually encourage people with carrot sticks or any other behavioural interventions um, to make sure that their results are actually published somewhere. Well, I'd like to thank you all very much for this enlightening uh, presentation. As if we didn't have enough things to worry about, now we have to make sure about the things we're doing. But there's a lesson here. All of us have to publish like crazy, so we don't. <laughs> thank you very much for coming and for uh, showing us uh, the waste equation. Thank you. Okay. Some of those are not in the paper.